And uh, here you can consider um, Deleuze's beautiful essay, Plato and the Simulacrum, where he celebrates the, the simulacrum, what Plato condemned as the, the poor copy of the uh, unique form. Uh, Deleuze elevates the, the simulacrum as uh, singular, as uh, a hecate that rebels against the tyranny of form. So as you know, Peirce argued that a sign becomes stronger as it spreads among the peoples. And that's, again, an example of a, a sign continuing to, um, to circulate on the diagram. The more an image is seen, passed on, commented upon, even parodied, the more it exists and the more times it spins around the diagram. So for example, uh, so-called viral media um, uh, thrive on the reproduction of images. How much an image has circulated, for example, um, on YouTube becomes part of the image. It becomes part of that fold of the information layer. I and Sorry. Uh-huh, okay. Um, how are we measuring the, the, the strength of the power of this image? Um, by how many times it circulates. Okay. How many times, exactly in the Persian way. How many times it gets taken up Turn, you know, turned into a new sign. It's not really the same image that keeps going. So how many on. times a, a new person sees this image, or um, if I look uh, at the same image every day, it gets stronger, or like? Uh, yeah, I think if we want to stick with the lessons of purse, we would say that yes, you by continuing to look at it and um, uh, have new ideas, make new signs of it, uh, it is uh, growing. I mean, do, do I necessarily have to think about it, or? I mean, could it be one of those everyday things that I see every day and I don't really notice? Or does it have to be something that, like, juts out at me every time I see it? This is a good question. yields some kind of information to me. This is a good question. Uh, and if it's, uh, if, you yeah, because part of, part of this talk is about um, how uh, our perception selects things from, you know, from the universe. Mm -hmm. um, if you, if you kind of unconsciously see something all, all the time, uh, it's a question how much you are, you know, perceptively selecting it and how much it's kind of remaining enfolded. You know, I think it could be that, uh, you know, uh, for 50 days in a row, your bus goes by this particular um, uh, garbage dump, and one day you're like, oh, you know, something's changed about that garbage dump, and that day, you have made a new sign, and you have kind of cut out the garbage dump in your perception. Right. So it, it got stronger the moment I, I pulled out that sign from it? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you went and told a bunch of people, look at the garbage dump, something's different. Um, it would become even more and more of a, it would, uh, on the diagram, it would be even more unfolded. You might even uh, go to other aspects of the garbage dump and <laughs> unfold them as well. And also, uh, another thing, is it possible that we have something like this except it's non-transmissible? Like, I, like an experience that I see that I can't, that a sign that I can't even reproduce to someone else, or even to myself again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like a sign that appears only once and then never yeah. can be reproduced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a good question. Can't that be um, done with the figure? I, don't, I mean, I, I would, I would use, uh, I would think about that using Bergson, because um, uh, for Bergson and, and for then for Deleuze, um, you know, the images, the image that, uh, um, for for example, an image that does not connect to memory, that kind of floats unmoored. Um, I mean, can we even call that a sign at all if it doesn't? imprint us with some kind of information, if it's just a mm -hmm. sign that... Well, remember, th these are Persian signs, right. and for Persa, uh, um, everything in the universe is a sign. Right. Everything, yeah, everything is will always be somewhere, forever. Everything you ever seen or perceive. But okay. most of them, in my opinion, fold back in. So you might, so like one day, you might have, um, you know, a, I would say, um, a dream that you had. Mm -hmm. You remember it for a second when you woke up? Um, it reinfolds into the virtual. It's not gone, but uh, perhaps nobody, you know, probably nobody will ever have access to it again. Oh. It became actual for it, unfolded for a moment. Mm -hmm. Andy? 
um, doesn't risk getting a little bit metaphysical if we tend to get closer to the object in the sense that it becomes more real, like you say, in opposed to what they are, right? If the simulation here is actually the simulation of the simulation uh, gets closer, gets us closer to the virtual and perhaps to the real, or do um, I miss into the I'm saying it becomes say? more and more actual. It becomes more and more actual. Mm -hmm. As it's denuded, because it's taken, it's the parts that are missing. But well, so I'm not saying it's denuded. I'm saying that, you know, if I... Um, I actually like the thing that, like the example we're about to look at. We're going to look at something that has become more real, I would argue, by virtue of circulating. Okay, so look at this um, cell phone video. So this, it's a, it's a small file, it's a video probably taken with a cell phone, uh, posted on the internet, um, and circulated in this low resolution form to many people who were able to see it. So you can think of that, that original event, that demonstration uh, on Van Ack Square after the election um, as something uh, if not infinite, vast, mm -hmm. of which some aspect has been um, unfolded into an image. In this case, it's a video image, it's a digital video image, so there is this intervening information layer. Um, and that, in turn, I would say, has, um, by being in its circulation, has generated new images. And the thing that I want to emphasize here is that each of these moments of unfolding, the unfolding from the infinite um, into an image, the unfolding of information into an image, um, encounters resistance. Most things do not easily unfold. And this, how many times was that viewed? Over 200,000 times. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we can, we can uh, think, of, think of that in terms of... Um, new signs being created in all those viewings. And because of the political circumstances of the, the Iranian demonstration videos, um, there, I mean, literally, these movies unfolded from the real uh, with difficulty uh, because of the, the censorship in Iran after the election. And we, the viewers in other countries, are... Uh, we ourselves are pulling, you know, we are part of this act of unfolding. And if anybody other than me got um, goosebumps watching this, um, this is part of the affect that occurs with the act of unfolding. The more resistance there is to, to unfolding, the more affect we're accompanying. So, my God, this has just gone on and on and on. Let's take a break. And then um, afterwards we can discuss. Now, and this also, a couple of people have been asking me to present research from my, my, uh, my new book that's about to come out. And I will be doing some of that uh, next week. But this is actually even newer because I, I worked on this topic um, while my book was in press. Okay. Imagine the realm of images that populates our world as a vast, variegated surface, containing everything. Your holiday snapshots, action movies, um, medical imaging, pictures of the surface of Jupiter, everything. 
And this field contains sounds and smells and other perceptibles too, as we started out the class talking about. But uh, for now, we'll bracket those out. So imagine that this field of images surrounds you like a bubble, translucent, and that you are looking at through it. You look through the field of images to their source, which are, which are distant in time and space. The holiday afternoon long ago, the movie set, the ultrasound of your own inter internal organs, which, although it's close to you, is, in fact, uh, very distant, uh, or the planet Jupiter. Now you realize that the source of the images that has arrived to you is infinitely vaster than the images you've received. I hope you're starting to recognize some, uh, some Berg's song here. But some of these images do not come to you directly from the source. They seem to get twisted or caught on the way in to your perception, for they reflect not a perceptible experience, but a calculation or a procedure. For example, images that reflect not a perceptible experience, but a calculation or a procedure. For example, the camera that took the snapshot was digital, and so the visible scene at the source has been assigned pixel values in order to be expressed in the snapshot. Uh, the Hollywood action movie was shot against a blue screen and keyed into a digital background. Uh, the movie star was chosen on the basis of a calculation of her audience appeal. The ultrasound of your internal organ consists of a translation of sound waves into vi visual data. And the picture of Ju Jupiter is an artist's rendering based on astronomical data. So all these calculations constitute an intervening layer between the world and the, and the, uh, the images that convey it to us. And I'm going to call that layer information. So now we have a diagram. <laughs> Okay, so this charmingly simple diagram is actually my um, intervention into Bergson's theory of, uh, of the image, which, which is also a theory of the universe, used by Deleuze in uh, Cinema One, among other places. Um, this point in the middle is um, you, insofar as you are a center of indetermination. That, pla that place where images come and hit your, your brain and are thereby perceived. So that I call image. Uh, then we have what Bergson sometimes calls the universe of all possible images, and which I've chosen to call the infinite for um, a variety of reasons, including my recent work with um, the concept of the infinite in Islam. Okay, so usually images come in to our center of indetermination, to our perception from the infinite. What I'm worried about, and I have been worried about this for about 10 years, which is uh, when I started working on unfolding, unfolding aesthetics, is um, that uh, images, not all images arrive to us from the infinite. A lot of images seem to be images of a calculation. Okay, so far? All right. And aesthetics, as you all know, in its simplest and most old-fashioned guise, is sim simply an account of how we engage with the perceptible world. Enfolding, unfolding aesthetics deals with the coming and going of images, a kind of recycling or conservation of mass, and it answers, where do images come from? And where did they go? By image, as you all know by now, I mean not only the visible, but all that is perceptible, visual, audible, tactile, uh, kinesthetic, olfactory, etc. Um, I suggested this idea to uh, an artist theorist, uh, Susan Scuckley, who paraphrased it thus, uh, a cosmic composite heap that is in an active state of re-molecularizing itself to create images yet to come. So just start to think of images, because you all are, now that you are so well versed in Christian semiotics and somewhat in the Bergson's model of the universe as this uh, model of uh, images shooting all around, you're starting to get a sense of the, the thickness of the universe compo composed by images constantly in movement. 
Enfolding Unfolding Aesthetics deals with the question, why is there so little to see? The fact that the world arrives to many of us, especially in the post-industrial world, pre-perceived. And there often seems to be little satisfying perceptual experience that we can have for ourselves. I'm going to give you some examples of that in a moment. Um, but for example, notice that we all, and is that a few of us, have Macintosh computers. Now, there's not much to see in a Macintosh computer, right? You know, if we scrutinize it, palpate it, um, listen to it, uh, we will not arrive at much that is singular, much that is different from any other Macintosh computer. It's not exactly a perceptible object. It's more of a crystallization of information, as I'm going to explain. Enfolding, unfolding aesthetics starts from Deleuze's investigation in the cinema books um, into how certain images arise to us or to the more disinterested perception of the cinema by being selected from the infinite. So that, again, is that unfolding from the infinite. Images that unfold directly to us from the infinite include things like our own perceptions, um, photographs, brush strokes, iconic images, in fact, uh, a great many things. Every sign that most of the signs, I should say, that Peirce talks about, uh, thunderclaps, um, many perceptibles arrive to us directly from the infinite and are selected or cut out from the infinite. My intervention in Deleuze's theory of signs is to insert another image plane between images and the infinite, namely information, a plane through which the semiotic process passes before images can arise. The information layer is most evident in digital and other qu quantified media, where there's a layer of code underlying the perceptibles that we see here in touch, like the family snapshot I mentioned earlier. If you, I'll show it to you now. <coughs> That's my family uh, in Alabama a few years ago. And you get a sense here. Here is an image presented to us. Simply looking at this, you can get a sense of the infinity from which it has been cut out. The sandy beach, the taste of the watermelon, the relationships among the family members. Um, all these things are infinite. The snapshot gives us some access to that infinity. But only some. Um, but it is a digital photo, so in a very conventional sense, it has been translated into information quantified. Uh, the information layer is also evident in anything intra intra industrially produced, anything whose physical being is the result of research that has been quantified. In the uh, information uh, computer theorist Claude Shannon's definition, Information is a qu quantifiable energy for determining the transmission cap capacity of a channel. Gregory Bateson defined information as the difference that makes a difference. And Deleuze takes this up. The difference that makes a difference. Gregory Bateson. Um, that is a meaningful organization of noise into signal. So by this, you a communications theory model. You can think of the infinite as noise and information as signals, that which organizes, selects and organizes some small part of the infinite so that we can perceive and make use of it. In information theory, those aspects of the infinite that do not interest us, that is almost all of it, are considered noise. So, as I just said, information organizes noise into something considered meaningful. And we need to start asking, considered by whom? Information is an unfolding from the infinite that precedes our perception. It's what, is, what has been selected from the infinite as valuable and thereby unfolded. And the rest remains enfolded. Now, I don't think in this talk I'm uh, talking about the theory of... Uh, of folds in relation to these um, planes of imminence, but that will come up. In our society, much of what we, oh, props time! <laughs> oh, forget it, just look at the toothbrush. 
Okay. What is, I brought mine, but it's probably just as well. Okay. What is a toothbrush? It's really a, a, con a concretization in, in matter, in plastic, of um, market research, um, uh, materials, science, uh, assembly type production. It's not exactly a material object. It's a materialization into the perceptible of information or as I have it here, a tactile, visible image of ergonomic and market research. So much of what is presented to us effectively is the result of a calculation. And sometimes it seems that our whole universe, and again, this we is kind of people who live in the post-industrial world where we're surrounded by uh, um, these sorts of objects. Um, in fact, uh, most places, most places in the world, uh, people, people's lives are populated by information images. Sometimes it seems our universe consists entirely of the smooth, designed, commodified surfaces of information-based media. It seems we are trapped in a world not of our invention. This is why Guy Debord testified in Society of the Spectacle, and what, what Debord testified and it's what Baudrillard was railing about in simulations. Information penetrates profoundly into perceptible surfaces. Indeed, it precedes the perceptible. And it's usually serving the needs of capital. This is an entire under other discussion that we can get into about the sort of coincidence between information and capital as two quantified uh, unfoldings from the infinite. However, the information level, as we remember from the diagram, is not the fundamental source of images. Now, a lot of the dualist um, uh, theories of new media um, presuppose a relationship, for example, Lev Manovich's relationship between interface and database, um, and assume that the perceptible to information uh, uh, relationship is the entirety of the relationship. And this leaves out the fundamental ground of these two things, which is um, you know, what I call the infinite, or you could call the world. So a triadic model is much more helpful. The information level is a filter, an interface to something else, the world in which programmers write code, artworks are dreamed up, toothbrushes are designed, Profits are reaped or lost, and infinitely more. So that world is the infinite. Um, yeah, can you push the slide again? And I'm also calling it the virtual. But certainly we can consider the ways in which images are encoded, or the news is encoded, uh, or the stock market encodes material processes. Um, so this, you imagine... Um, Imagine that one of these stocks is uh, Monsanto. Say the changes in Monsanto stock are affecting the stock price in dollars on whatever day that is. Monsanto, as we know, is working with uh, uh, gen genetically modified corn, for example. Um, maybe there's been a strike of farmers in uh, India who refuse, uh, sorry, I don't think India would grow genetically modified corn. You know, something like, maybe some farmers are on strike against the use of genetically modified corn, or there's been some, uh, some kind of publicity scandal. This thing that happens in the world influences the, the stock of Monsanto, um, but this event in the world is translated not into an image that arrives to us, but, it, but in this case... Um, into a quantification only. So you get a sense of the enormous reduction that occurs between the infinite and information. Uh, yeah. So the stock market is an example of information that is dense with meaning. It yields almost nothing in the way of image. The stock market graph is an, an iconic image. But let's think about how socks are encoded. Okay, now it's prop time. 
They're clean. <laughs> <laughs> Examine carefully. Use all the skills you've been learning. Okay, socks. A sock is quite material. If you knit the sock yourself, it's the direct actualization of a virtuality that starts with you, the time you spent knitting, the quality of the wool, where the wool came from, the factory where the wool was spun, a rich, ever-expanding field of virtualities um, whose actual outcome is your homemade sock. But with store-bought socks, we confront the paradox that sto socks are made of information. In its color, texture, pattern, and packaging, a sock encodes branding and market research. Logos are images that encode information quite densely for they embody thousands of hours and millions of dollars of research. And what would appeal to whom? For example, the Calvin Klein logo. Uh, question, when you buy socks, do you uh, avoid socks with logos? Yes. You try to get plain socks? Yes. Yeah. That's also a marketing category. On this diagram, you can see that socks are an image of information, which in turn draws on cotton, wool, elastic, machines, labor, factories, marketing, market research, etc. Uh, perhaps not an infinite, but a very large number of valuables that, you know, for now I'm just saying they take place in the infinite. I'm going to complicate this category a little bit later. So, from infinite to information to image. So, you've all been looking at my Calvin Klein socks. And you can kind of perceive the relationship between the image uh, the color, the fabric, the, uh, the logo, the stylish stripes, and information, right? Are you getting a sense of how these socks were produced from, from a set of calculations of ideas about what socks might appeal? And of course, simply because they're a machine-produced object. Um, that's also a, a calculation of sorts. That seems okay, right? <laughs> Is there anything unusual about these socks? They have holes. Mm -hmm, that is one thing. <laughs> and the, on the diagram, that's because they are re-enfolding back into the infinite. Ah. Here conceived in the most material manner. Interesting. Yep, that's one of them. Anything else? Look carefully. Okay, you're an art consultant, Katie, and you've well, got the socks in front of you. Just, if I had a, uh, a boy instead of a girl, this was going to be the name so that I could have a child named Calvin Klein. <laughs> and, you know, I immediately focus on what this is my name. Okay, well, let's look at the picture. Um, Bree, could you uh, show us the picture of the socks again? Yeah. So you have an equal <laughs> access. Okay. Anything odd? Andy? I don't know if that's odd, but the logo is an absence. I mean, it, it's in absence. It's where the spots are not. These are not real Calvin Klein socks. Uh -huh. How do you know? Because I know. How? Because the logo's wrong. It's the wrong the logo's wrong. And it's, uh, it's the wrong font. Uh, it's uppercase, lowercase. It's very awkward. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like Calvin too. Klein. When we buy Calvin Klein, Most we're paying for the name. And the reason you know you're paying for the name is because the clothing itself falls apart in a year. <laughs> yes, these are knockoffs. I got them in Syria. They're from a Syrian knockoff factory. And in Syria, you can get all kinds of fabulous clothes. You can get a shirt with a Nike swoosh on the bottom and on the bottom, and a Calvin Klein across the top. <laughs> um, where am I on here? Uh, yes. So you can imagine um, drawing on the Persian semiotics that we. Uh, learned yesterday how the, um, a series of signs um, that have been produced. So let's say the original sign was an authentic Calvin Klein sock, and maybe somebody took it in their suitcase to Syria, where the uh, knockoff, the knockoff artists um, produced a new sign um, based on their own ideas of uh, color and taste, and also perhaps on the um, you know, 
the adequacy of the machines they use. So in a way, this is a new sign based on the original Calvin Klein sock, still referring back to it. Um, yeah, so here's a knockoff sock. I bought it and I've worn them for years and they're disintegrating as Lionel noticed, uh, returning to the infinite. Eventually they'll uh, decompose in the landfill and we've got more to say about that kind of memory in a moment. Okay, Marie, could you find us something else to look at please, like a blank page? Actually, no, let, let's look at the diagram again, please. Okay. Enfolding, unfolding aesthetics is useful for critical thinking, for asking what is deemed useful as information and what is forgotten as mere matter. Also, who is doing this deeming and this forgetting? Uh, what continues to be taken up? What generates new signs as it circulates? So in Persian fashion, we can think of the process of um, image production as a series of cycles around and around this diagram. Perhaps forever, but probably most images die and uh, re-enfold after one or two spins. Enfolding, unfolding instead. Oh yeah, okay. What continues to be taken up and to generate new signs as it circulates? Enfolding, unfolding aesthetics is useful for those of us who are thinking about art because it helps observe the manner in which artworks select certain elements to unfold, either from the infinite or from information, or choose to make certain elements remain latent. It's a triadic aesthetics, and it informs the way an artwork makes a viewer or participant aware of the relationships between the image or the object and the information from which it was produced and between information and the world from, it was from which it was selected. It may, so some artworks and indeed other kinds of objects uh, draw our attention to that triadic relationship. Others obscure it. And I like information, uh, I like enfolding, unfolding aesthetics because it helps us to think of a way that in our world, even in a world oversaturated with images and with um, you know, alienating images, images that come to us from somewhere else, it's still a creative struggle to pull images into being. Okay, so now I want to talk about the virtual, um, or what I call for this title, for this paper, uh, The Unthought at the Heart of Wood. At, at the heart of wood. Wood, yeah. yeah. The title of this paper is um, Enfolding, Unfolding Aesthetics, or the Unthought at the Heart of Wood. Um, taking, a, uh, I think, Deleuze in his book on Foucault, um, in his book on Foucault, I believe, uh, talks about the unthought at the heart of thought, which is the, the virtual of thought. And in trying to uh, think materially, I'm calling it the unthought of the heart of wood. And you're calling that the virtual? Um, for the moment. Yeah. Okay. So, see this vast expanse of the infinite, the source of all, inf all image, of all information, of everything. Enfolding, unfolding aesthetics privileges the virtual, or what is not present to perception or to thought, nor is it present to information, nor even to thought. The virtual is a vast field of non-actuality, but not nothingness, from which a few actual things arise. Now, something that I'm just recently uh, struggling with is that um, we encounter a question as to the difference between virtual immaterialities, such as concepts, and a materiality that is also in a way, virtual, in that it is inaccessible and inconceivable. And Deleuze deals with these differences in various ways, despite the fact that his philosophy is um, considered a, a monism, um, on his own end with the uh, Guattari. So in the fold, the explication of uh, Leibniz, mind and matter, monads and bodies, are clearly distinguished and different rules apply to each. And importantly, 
the monad or the soul has access to the entire universe. Well, at first it seems that bodies do not, but this is, uh, this is modified so that even bodies have a monad-like quality. Yes? Andy. In, in the fold, I mean, Ryan. Yeah. In, in the fold, uh, a monad for Deleuze has both a body and a soul. Yes. It's not that the monad is the soul and then there is a body. Mm -hmm. There's two floors of a monad. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, indeed. But thinking about uh, materiality, such as, um, you know, Deleuze says that um, um, any organically formed entity, for example, anything formed by um, internal differentiation is a body and has a soul. But when it gets to things formed by plastic or elastic forces, um, and they seem to be formed from the outside, at first it seems that they do not have a soul, but this begins to change later in the book. Um, still, even, to, even at the end of the fold, there are some materialities that still do not have souls. Um, and in Cinema One, the monisms of Bergson and Peirce permit a material definition of the universe, the plane of imminence or flowing matter. However, those are fairly dematerialized matters. Bergson's universe is composed of light, and Peirce's signs are ultimately composed in the mind. Deleuze and Gattari's concept of the machinic phylum dignifies matter by recognizing that it too is infinite and thus in part virtual. The machinic phylum, this is in A Thousand Plateaus, is, quote, the flow of matter in continuous variation, and note that that is exactly a Bergson, conveying singularities and traits of expression. And they also say the machinic phylum is a destratified, deterritorialized de matter. Matter that we could say does not exist for perception or conception. In other words, most matter. Certain aspects of this flowing matter are taken up, and they, they seem to be saying taken up by humans, but it's, I, um, I want to keep that open for other agents as well. Certain aspects of the machinic phylum, the flowing matter, are taken up and uh, used, formed, refined as an assemblage, which they call a constellation of singularities deducted from the flow, selected organized, stratified. So this is another interesting way to think about how one element, or one little fold in the machinic phylum here, that the material infinite is taken up, say in a different, in a given culture at a given time, by a science, by an artisan, um, and its qualities uh, developed and explored. So all human culture is assemblage, invention, identifying aspects of the machinic phylum and developing them. And Deleuze and Gattari also point out here that Gilbert Simondon, who is that, that great thinker of individuation, um, criticized uh, a concept from Husserl that uh, matter takes its shape simply because form is imposed on it, because that assumes that matter is homogeneous. Matter is just like this formless stuff um, until form imposes its laws on it. Instead, as they paraphrase from Simondon, matter is an entire energetic, this is a, a long quote, matter is an entire energetic materiality in movement carrying singularities or hecates that are already like impl implicit forms that are topological. You know this term hecate? That, uh, from uh, uh, the Latin uh, hec, hec, uh, there it is, I think. So uh, singularities, there it is, only one, only one unique thing. Or you can just say singularity, which seems to be right um, Carrying singularities, or hecates, H-A-E-C-C-I-T-Y, that are already like implicit forms that are topological rather than geometrical. 
and that combined with the forces of deformation. For example, the variable undulations and torsions of the fibers guiding the operation of splitting wood. End quote. As well as variable intensive effects such as the wood's porosity and resistance that affect your efforts to, uh, to uh, split or carve it. And they say, at any rate, it is a question of surrendering to the wood, then following where it leads. So this is, uh, this is the heart of wood, unthought at the heart of wood, of my title. So for now, I'm going to hold that an aspect of the infinite virtual is the radical materiality of the machinic filing, the unthought at the heart of wood. When we think about where images come from, I want us to be thinking about the virtual, the infinite, and also something so physically real, so real, um, so material, that it is utterly unknowable to us. Most philosophy privileges what actually exists. Maybe that's not true. And who can blame it? However, Deleuze and Gattari, as well as Deleuze writing on his own, emphasized again and again, using many different um, conceptions and metaphors, that the relevant category is not being what exists, but becoming what changes. This can be traced to the influence of Henri, Henri Bergson, and Bergson's emphasis that in duration, all things change, becoming something else, evolving, evolving in unforeseen ways. And the moment of becoming, as you know, is what fascinated Deleuze and Gattari. So they're interested in phenomena just from their getting started, before they have truly formed. The line of flight, um, the free marks with which Francis Bacon begins a painting in order to ward off cliches. The moment before something takes form. These are all moments where the virtual becomes actual, or something entirely new comes into the world. And for these thinkers, the virtual is the engine of change and even of life. Hence the paradox of privileging the virtual or what does not actually exist over the actual. Now, can we please have the, uh, the green slide? Okay. Taking questions from the lecture, do you want to I'd rather wait till after, okay. unless it's a burning question. Well, I just kind of want to understand your reference to the uh, to wood uh, and how when you talk about machinic phylum mm -hmm. and the rhizome, uh, I'm wondering oh. how the rhizome relates to um, machinic phylum and your use of wood. Mm. Yeah, so far because the rhizome. Because they don't plant. Yeah, 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 I know. I know. They, actually, I, I do explore that in another context. Um, and when you're thinking about plants themselves, and that's where Deleuze and Gattari got started with the, the useful model of the rhizome. Um, uh, real rhizomes, like couch grass and mm. tubers, they, uh, they are uh, part of the machinic phylum and they behave in uh, unpredictable ways. Um, but uh, rhizomatic activity and what occurs on the machinic phylum, they're kind of separate concepts. They are, they're they totally separate. Yeah, yeah, the machinic phylum is, is much larger. Okay, Rhizom that makes sense. Rhizomes makes occur sense. on it materially. A rhizome as a, a concept, um, yeah. You, but could, I guess maybe you condition. could say that machinic phylum is rhizomatic, but rhizomes refer more to the realm of concepts than... Is the machinic phylum rhizomatic? Hmm. It doesn't seem like a, a useful... It doesn't seem like a useful concept. Okay. But we can, we can keep on thinking about it. Okay, to emphasize the images in that uh, unfolding diagram that you've all memorized by now, that images are the manifest outer layer of a deeply unfolded for force, source. I introduced two terms that are used in Islamic thought, principally in Shiism and Sufism to describe manifest and latent states. Zahir and Bethin. Um, Zahir implies 
It actually, its etymology comes from the word for back, uh, zuhr, uh, and it implies um, what is unfolded, what is manifest, um, what is explicit. And in, um, in theology, it's used to describe the meanings in the Quran that are available to everybody. You could say the unfolded meanings. Betin uh, connects etymologically to the belly, betin. Um, and it signifies deeper, implicit meanings that are not accessible to all, but they, that may potentially be explicated. And uh, yeah, so in, in uh, enfolding, unfolding aesthetics, images are um, relatively zahir, or manifest. And uh, the infinite is relatively betzen, or latent. And you could even say that the infinite is betzen, or latent, in an image. Now, this concept, these concepts of uh, zahir and bet, uh, betzen, are central to Shiite thought, which, unlike Sunni thought, privileges interpretation. So you can say that the basic, uh, you can characterize Sunni Islam as um, really placing great emphasis on consensus and a lack of dissension, whereas by contrast, uh, Shiite thought privileges the knowledge of uh, the imam, or the, the one person who is able to interpret those meanings in the Quran that are enfolded or inaccessible to other people. Um, so as an, as an imam can reach into the words of the Quran and unfold latent meanings, as, uh, as uh, the Shia believe, but the Sunni do not. Um, so we can reach into an image and unfold, bring out onto the surface some of its latent contents. And uh, in Sufism as well, in the mystical strand of Islam, um, there is also reference to, uh, to uh, betin, just as the, um, what is latent in a mystical sense that anybody can bring out. It doesn't require the uh, authority of the imam. Uh, yeah, so um, if we have an image, like if, if you think of the, uh, the photograph of my family on the beach, um, you can see the, the zahir of the image, uh, what is evident. Zahir, I'll just like, Americanize it. You can see what is ev evident to perception, but you can, almost in a hermeneutic way, reach into that image and draw out um, some, a few more aspects of the infinite, either by contemplating it or by doing some research. So the picture is unfolded, the infinite or some aspect of it is enfolded in the picture. We can try to pull that up. Ultimately, the enfolded model of the image does not distinguish between material and immaterial. All of these levels, image, information, and infinite, are real, and Deleuze the sense that the real encompasses the virtual and the actual. The actual is what exists, a thing, an event, a concept. The virtual is that which does not exist um, in actuality, but conditions the emergence of the actual. The virtual is the truly infinite ground against which the fewest actual entities emerge. So again, as with uh, Bergson's image of the universe, as with Peirce's theory of signs, we get a sense that whatever is um, actual to us is kind of like a um, it's kind of like a tip of the iceberg, except uh, always in motion, always changing, of an infinitely greater virtual. The virtual conditions. Now, the virtual consists of all that cannot presently be thought. It's an asymptote for thought, or, as Deleuze writes, a powerlessness at the heart of thought. Most materiality is virtual, too. Things exist physically while remaining mostly virtual. As Elizabeth Groves writes, philosophers who are sympathetic to matter, that is, don't see matter as something to dominate, uh, among whom she includes Bergson, Henry James and Deleuze, and I would add Peirce, argue that we carve out things in experience. She argues that we carve out things in experience. So much of what exists in the world does not exist as things for us. 
Simple experiments bear this out. Other people's experience is mostly virtual to us, but there are ways in which we can make their experience more actual to ourselves if we want to. My Calvin Klein sock is real, Calvin Klein, but the machine on which it was knit is an inaccessible part of the machinic phylum. We, you know, we, don't, we know it exists, we don't know much about it. Thus it is in some way virtual as far as we're concerned. Um, the sock's uh, chemical and molecular structure are similarly virtual. The tightness of the elastic is uh, virtual to you, but not to me. Uh, in another writing, I suggested that the infinite could also be con considered the Earth, and this refers to another uh, um, to the geology geology of morals in the Thousand Plateaus. Materially. The earth is what precedes all things and to which all things return. Um, do you want to see the diagram again, or do you have a good sense of that, that dense and deeply enfolded? I like to see it. Okay. All right. So for a moment, let's consider this stuff, the earth. And all of a sudden, this starts to look a little bit like a picture of uh, our, our planet. Mater materially, the earth is what precedes all things and to which all things return. The objects that cycle through our lives return to the earth in a literal sense. Thinking of the earth as the virtual is compatible with Bergson's concept of the virtual. For Bergson argued that matter is composed by duration, the way it persists, decays, and transforms. He wrote, matter is an infinitely dilated past and it helps us to consider that the virtual lies in matter. So when I think of an infinitely dilated past, I do think of, um, uh, of geology, of um, ruined cities uh, buried under the earth. I think of landfills, um, pa pasts that have existed that are now inaccessible to us, that are now our virtual, and yet, they are enfolded in the earth. Materialistically, we could call the virtual thought's powerlessness at the heart of wood. The original is the powerlessness at the heart of thought. And in fact, this is an ancient idea. Since the ancient Greeks, philosophers have used wood as the ideal of something that means little in itself, but is full of potentiality. In fact, we could say that uh, a machinic phylum um, is, uh, is similar to this, this uh, old concept. The 10th century Shiite theologian, Abu Yaqub al-Sijistani, argued that the Quranic revelation required interpretation, comparing it to wood that must be worked in order to be made in something useful. And St. Thomas Aquinas, who incidentally uh, would not have been able to come up with a uh, justification of the um, unity and all-powerfulness of God had it been not for the, the writings that he inherited from the Arab philosopher, I'm sorry, the um, uh, Persian philosopher, Ibn Sina. Uh, yeah. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote that a piece of wood was a finite form containing infinite potential in that an infinite number of forms could potentially be carved from it. Uh, okay, can you go forward, please? I've got a, an architectural work to look at. Okay. This detail of the minbar of the Sultan Kate Bey Mosque in Cairo suggests the infinity internal to wood. Simply because in this this pattern, this is a pattern that is infinitely extensible. It's a pattern that could be repeated forever, a geometric pattern. But um, partly because of uh, uh, concerns in Islamic um, philosophy with both the extensive infinite and with the in infinitesimal, there's also this tendency to work infinitesimally and to suggest that there's almost a, a monad or um, uh, an inf infinitesimal that uh, contains the entire universe. 
Uh, yeah, so this picture suggests the infinity internal to wood. So evidently, my notion of materiality is not exactly Marxist materialism. Uh, it's more similar to the Deleuze and Gattari's characterization of the machinic phylum. Is that material that, like the grain of wood, guides the artisan to invent and to come up with thoughts that she would not have had in the absence of this obdurate, densely enfolded material. So wood helps us come up with new thoughts. Uh, can you show the next picture, please, Bree? It's a detail of a beautiful artwork uh, made of uh, scrap lumber. Uh, can you go forward and, s and see if I've got a larger picture of it? Yeah, okay, let's take a look at that. Bergson, in Creative Evolution, pointed out that far from being the rational masters who should dominate dumb creatures, we humans are more similar to animals and plants than we are different from them. He wrote, our intellect is intended to secure the perfect fitting of our body to its environment, to represent the relations of external things and themselves. In short, to think matter. We humans are not so different from the things we think about, and that is why we are able to think alongside them. That's why we can anticipate their reactions, like um, massaging a dog based on where you think it might ache, to a uh, sort of brutal um, uh, juxtaposition, uh, se sectioning the muscles of a, a slaughtered animal on the basis of our knowledge of our own muscles, to responding mimetically to a potato plant infesting with bugs, um, and calling on our plant nature to find a way to cure it. I'm sure this is kind of instinctively true to you, that we feel, it's possible to, to feel and learn the ways of uh, animals and plants, and even uh, minerals, in a way that is not a projection of human qualities onto them, but is really kind of becoming animal, becoming plant, becoming mineral. In fact, Bergson likes to cite Plato comparing philosophers to, quote, good cooks who cut things up according to their natural articulations. I find that so interesting. Philosophers are like good cooks who cut things up according to their natural articulations. It's just a metaphor, though. This response to the world, according to Bergson, is instinct, what we have in common with animals and plants. And this is still in creative evolution. So when we get in touch with the heart of wood, we're using our instinct to call upon our internal cellulose-like nature. Ah, I have a new section. It is, it? it's, mm -hmm. huh? I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to just make sure that it's so that we are more like animals and that we look in our world, or look at our world and how we fit in it and how to use it. Um, so we... We share a lot in the creative evolution. Um, Bergson is talking, he says that um, he does accept that humans are kind of at the top of the evolutionary scale, but he says it would help us um, have more knowledge if we could um, connect with organisms that um, branched off uh, at different points in evolution because they have something that's not exactly knowledge, but they, they have a relationship to the world that we have, that we do not have. And our instinct is a way of uh, drawing upon this knowledge that's um, kind of deep in our own selves of um, what these other creatures know. And in fact, I think since Bergson, that, that has uh, come to be um, proven even more so, as it turns out, that the human body is composed um, or the human genome, for example, includes so many bits of genes from, uh, from other animals, from viruses that we have had in the past. So in fact, we are genetically inhabited by our animal and vegetable past. Okay, all right, look at the diagram. Um, drawing your attention to the way images cycle around, cycle around, and of course, as we know from Peirce, it's not the same image that keeps traveling. It's transformed at every moment. It becomes a new sign, a new sign, reinfolds, 
generates a new sign, which in turn might get taken up. Uh, there's information for his image. as a new sign. Keeps on going around and around. Um, so we can look at the, um, the series of transformations of signs, a kind of uh, life cycle. In terms of how many times a singular, um, you know, what person would call a, a um, process of semiosis, cycles around the diagram, changing as it goes. Um, this process is very much like person's semiotic process. That's what, that's what <laughs> happens when I uh, extemporize. Whereby signs necessarily mutate as they circulate, they still reference their source, but it becomes more and more distant, as you all understand really well now. But, and in my opinion, uh, the most interesting kinds of image are those that bear the traces of their own unfolding. And this is something that we can maybe discuss um, after the break. Um, yes, in fact, that's what's, that's what's coming right now. This uh, process of cycling is what we usually call mediation. So, Brie, could you go forward to that uh, film still, please? Actually, a, a video still? Yep. Okay. This is a still from the DVD of um, the movie Christ Stopped at Eboli, based on the book from 1945 by Carlo Levi. So, this image, this is an image on a DVD, um, probably transferred from video to the digital medium, although that I'm not sure of. But uh, definitely transferred from a 35 millimeter film. In turn, that film was adapted from a book. So now you already get a sense of several iterations, several uh, semiotic uh, uh, transformations. And um, so here we have 35 millimeter film adapted from a book, subtitled in English, transferred to DVD, and the sound on the DVD has this really weird Doppler effect. Uh, it's very disconcerting. And uh, I chose this because there was a scratch on the film frame, and that uh, material uh, index uh, remains in the, uh, in the DVD. Um, in an entirely new shape. So all these new turns um, block our access to the original text and uh, thicken the mediating space. So now between, well, me who saw the movie and the original movie and the original book in Italian, there are a number of uh, blocks or filters that mean I don't have so much access to that original, but I do have access to what happened to it and where it, where it came from. Katie? Yeah, no, I was just thinking in our, in our, uh, our first set of lectures that I did not know that when you transfer 35 millimeter to DVD is you lose frames. So that the action you see mm -hmm. on, the, on the DVD uh, the master duplication with the process of going from DVD to 35 millimeter, you lose frames. You don't lose any. Oh, in the other direction. Right. But yes. You lose, um, yeah, uh, because a bit uh, of the richness of the experience that they're mm -hmm. now trying to replicate with you know digital to make it look like it was a, a 70s movie. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I guess because uh, film is 36 frames per second and uh, video is. Uh, 26? 24. 24? Yeah. And when you do those, and I, I did not know that, is that when they go from whether it's video tape or um, uh, 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 film, mm -hmm. that you, you, I mean, again, it's probably you know, basically imperceptible. Mm -hmm. you know, the main thing is we're digitizing something that, is, that otherwise would be gone forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the fact that there is a loss from the original. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the um, uh, quantification creates its own artifacts. And any, any act of quantification, like, like a translation, um, you know, obviously you, you lose some of the original. Um, and also, you know, especially with digitization, with, which people like sort of ideologically to say um, has no material effect. 
Uh, it does. Usually it's fine. We don't care. Like you say, it's great to have the thing preserved. But it's, it's, um, it's good to keep in mind that this quantification is still the creation of a new sign you know, with its own relationships to economy and power. Okay. So while all these new turns, the transfer, the scratch, the translation, um, block our access to the original text, they thicken the mediating space and allow the material history of the image to speak. Now, this starts to sound like a celebration of decay. And in fact, in a lot of my previous work, I have celebrated decay for just this reason. I said that, uh, you know, for example, films or videos that have uh, uh, broken down chemically um, you know, speak more to our own bodily materiality. Um, but in some ways, it's a rather romantic and defeatist gesture. Nevertheless, it's exciting and productive to think of mediation as the life cycle of images. Thinking of mediation as a thickening allows us to consider it not as a block between us and the source, but as a new source. Okay. So, now I've got some stuff about digital media. Many scholars argue that digital media are independent of technology because their foundation is a non-physical array of numbers or, or of numbers of signals. And this notion rests on an ideological discourse of futurism. Um, as in, in the future, our computers will allow us to have fully immersive experiences of synthetic worlds. It's just that at present, the processes are is too slow, the bit mapping is unconvincing, and the, the head-mounted display stinks of sweat. Um, but as you know, this is not true because every digital medium rests on an analog base. In practice, digital media, I'm shouting, <laughs> digital media are always and entirely physical. Those numbers or on-off impulses are carried by, usually carried by electrons, which are as physical as can be and rife with unpredictable effects. Data compression, software conventions, software mistakes, hardware qualities, transmission properties, um, all of these processes are entirely physical and historical properties of digital media. And the remote ser servers that hold all our data, that allow us to think that we're saving the environment by uh, not printing things out, um, saving trees, those, uh, the servers, those giant warehouses in the desert, account for 2% of the world's energy use. That's a lot of coal powering our virtual world. So all these real phenomena, um, all these actual phenomena, leave their traces on the image. And the great thing is that the image sometimes allow us, allows us to detect them and that pulling, pulling things out.